Hi everybody, uh, thanks for coming to my talk. I'm going to be talking today about automated zero-day discovery in 2021. Uh, basically a project that we did that uh, shows how we can help squash embedded low-hanging fruit uh, automatically and not just with manual research. Uh, before I get into the technical data, just a, a quick intro about myself. Uh, my name is Shachar Menashe. I'm currently Senior Director of Security Research at JFrog. <laughs> my credentials are mostly uh, reverse engineering, binary, uh, script, backend, uh, and vulnerability research. But uh, as of late, I'm trying to, uh, I've been getting more into uh, automated uh, vulnerability discovery uh, instead of manually how uh, we all used to do that to do, to do it i wanted to give a shout out also to the co-authors of this research and this presentation uh which uh, won't be presenting with me today uh daniel stanislav amin and joss from forescout and uh, Saf from asaf and dennis from jfrog they're all a part of this research we collaborated on it together uh, but i'm presenting today Okay, so uh, let's talk about the outline of what I'm going to show today. Basically, first, I'm going to talk about a set of vulnerabilities that we named the infra halt uh, vulnerabilities. It's a set of 14 vulnerabilities that uh, we disclosed, JFrog in collaboration with uh, Clarity in an uh, embedded TCP IP stack. So we'll get into that. You know, what were the found issues? What, what's the impact of each issue, et cetera? And then we'll get to the main part of the presentation, which is automated vulnerability discovery. So basically real world techniques for automated vulnerability discovery in binaries, meaning without the source code when we have only the binary. Uh, and I'll try to share as much technical details uh, as possible in, in, in this part. So this is the main event uh, of the presentation. And then later, uh, I'll go into detail about one of the detected, automatically detected vulnerabilities uh, from InfraHalt, how it was detected with automated vulnerability discovery, so we can see how it actually works in the real world. All right, so uh, let's move to the first part. So let's talk about, as an intro, uh, let's talk about the InfraHalt vulnerabilities. What are they? What are their impacts? So we'll understand later. Uh, when we combine this with the automated vulnerability discovery, how it all fits together. So first of all, InfraHalt, like I said, is a set of 14 vulnerabilities and uh, it's, it affects the, uh, an embedded TCP IP stack called Niche Stack. So this is a TCP IP stack with a, a long history. It's been developed in the 90s and it, it, uh, the company InterNiche was acquired by HTC Embedded in 2016. There are several flavors as common with these types of software. And actually there's a lot of variants of this uh, TCP IP stack that popped up in previous research that uh, we did and uh, obviously other people did. And there have been uh, previous CVEs as well found in this TCP IP stack. You can see on the right hand side that other than providing the bare bones network and transport layer like IP, TCP, uh, et cetera, it also provides a high level application layer services. So HTTP, DHCP, DNS, SSH. So it's actually quite a robust stack, which for attackers means uh, there's more attack surface. <laughs> so let's see, uh, let's get into the vulnerabilities that, that were found. So again, 14 vulnerabilities, a collaborative effort between JFrog and Forescout. You can see uh, a listing of all of the vulnerabilities here. Uh, basically, there are five components of the stack that were affected, uh, also uh, for reference written here, but the DNS, HTTP, ICMP, TCP, and TFTP. The two most critical vulnerabilities are remote code execution vulnerabilities, so the top two ones, and we'll show actually uh, how we exploited them. Uh, it wasn't too hard because of uh, it, it's on real-time operating systems, which usually don't have a lot of mitigations. And again, some of these uh, vulnerabilities were found manually and some were found automatically, which is what we'll focus on today. Other than the critical vulnerabilities, there are some vulnerabilities here that provide an out of service that might be critical uh, depending on the context. And other vulnerabilities help with the exploitation of other ones. So for example, it's, you can do TCP spoofing and DNS cache poisoning, which helps if you need to send a valid DNS response. So, uh, we'll, we'll get to that uh, a bit later, but this is the set of vulnerabilities that were our test bed, basically. 
So I'm going to focus a bit technically on the first two vulnerabilities. It's also important to understand in terms of uh, the automated vulnerability discovery, but also just because it's always interesting to uh, learn from vulnerabilities and make sure we don't do the same mistakes again. Um, so the first uh, remote code execution vulnerability is uh, on DNS, uh, on, and specifically on DNS response, uh, which is actually pretty common. So uh, the, the DNS client sends out requests, and then the attacker sends out a response, a malicious response, which uh, creates a heap overflow in this case. And the problem in this case, which is something that we also saw in previous research, so it's a well-known anti-pattern, uh, there's a DNS field that's called uh, RD length in the response, and uh, basically it's the length of, of the DNS response. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, real-time embedded stacks, they have a fixed, they allocate a fixed amount of uh, buffer size as can be seen here in this uh, struct uh, for the response, but actually uh, the response length is totally uh, user controlled. So you just uh, send a response with a big length here and then you can start overriding this whole uh, struct. As you can see from this um, MCPY, uh, we start overriding from the PTR name and RDLAN is completely controlled by us. And this will eventually overwrite all of uh, this struct. Since the struct is uh, saved on the heap, then we can continue to overflow other heap structures. So the way we exploited this is actually quite classic and bare bones. Uh, we use a classic unlink technique on the heap. I'm not going to go over how uh, exactly this works because it's uh, one of the most uh, well-known techniques. Uh, and a bit out of scope for this uh, presentation. But what I said earlier is that uh, in these embedded uh, real-time operating systems, there's almost always no mitigation. So there's no safe unlinking, there's no ASLR. So it's uh, quite easy to write a full exploit once you get a heap overwrite uh, prototype. So basically how the this exploit works is we override the DNS entry structure that we saw before. We create a fake free chunk. We override the metadata of the next uh, heap block or heap entry. And then we know the layout of the heap. We did it just by uh, resetting the device with a denial of service attack. And then we know exactly how the heap is structured. In the real world, a uh, more cunning attacker would probably do heap shaping, uh, even if the memory uh, structure is not known beforehand. Uh, we can do heap feng shui or heap shaping uh, to make sure that we override exactly what we intend to override. So here we override some heap metadata, create a fake free chunk, also override the top bin of the heap and create, create our metadata that will cause when uh, the code flows to a, a free operation uh, right after our override, uh, it will cause an unlink operation and basically it will let us write an arbitrary pointer to an arbitrary location. So basic, uh, basic heap uh, exploitation. So FD and BK here uh, would be used uh, as an arbitrary overwrite. And what we can see here, uh, we actually, the attacker still needs to create a valid DNS response, which is problematic uh, unless you're sniffing because uh, you need to know the source port and the TXID of the DNS. But here we have another two uh, CVEs that we actually showed that the source port and TXID aren't random, they're sequential. So it's very easy for the attacker to guess these. And overall, it's an extremely exploitable uh, vulnerability. So this is the first vulnerability, which again, uh, this one was found manually. And the second vulnerability uh, is another uh, remote code execution, which was found automatically, which will get into more details later how it was found exactly. But just to understand what's the vulnerability, basically it's another pretty classic vulnerability. Um, it's a heap overflow when you're uh, using the HTTP server and the attacker requests a, a, a post request with a very long URI. So specifically the part after the, uh, the host name. Uh, if it's very long, as we can see in this uh, packet capture here, more than 52 bytes actually it will cause a buffer overflow and the exploitation is actually the same like the the last uh, cv that we showed just it needs uh, some more careful heap shaping but again it's very easy since you can cause a denial of service and reset the device if you want with any one of our other cves uh, if not then again you can do heap shaping uh, 
in the normal way. So now let's talk about the in high level and some technical detail uh, about the automated vulnerability discovery process, how what's common and how it differs from a manual researcher that would go over it and how we use this system in order to find some vulnerabilities here and focusing on one of them. Okay, so, so first of all, the method of operation, uh, let's start in high level. The method of operation of the system is mapping uh, data flow between uh, external user input, which we call sources, uh, and dangerous functions, which we call sinks. Uh, so basically the idea with the system is if external user input is uh, flowing and getting in an unfiltered state or semi-filtered state to a dangerous function, then there is a vulnerability. Here you can see uh, an example of uh, where the source is get env. So for example, the environment is something that we consider untrusted. So if get env is called, we consider the return value of that function as compromised, as, uh, as a possible user input. And then if that user input flows and it's not filtered on, on the way and it flows, for example, to system, the CAPI, uh, libc API, then we might have a command injection vulnerability because if uh, an attacker controls the input to system, uh, then the attacker uh, can insert malicious shell meta characters and run whatever command he or she wants. Of course, you can take other sources and sinks, and that's what the system does. It considers a, a set of them. So instead of get in, you might have receive uh, direct network input. And instead of system, you might have strcpy, where the destination is a fixed buffer. And then in that case, it would be a stack overflow or a heap overflow uh, vulnerability, a buffer overflow. So that is the, the high level method of, of operation. And let's dive into the details of how we contend with real world cases. Okay, so now uh, this is the detailed method of operation and I'm going to explain about each part here. So first of all, the input to the system is uh, just a, a binary. We don't rely on source code. We don't have any uh, prerequisites from the binary. It just needs to be a binary and uh, we have to know the architecture, but actually we also have uh, auto detection for that. But, but uh, let's start uh, from the scenario that we already have, uh, uh, we already have the binary disassembled. So how uh, do we achieve the data flow analysis that I mentioned uh, in the real world? So first of all, the first step is taking this code and converting it to intermediate representation. And uh, specifically, we use Ghidra's intermediate representation, which is called uh, P code. And uh, I'll dive into that intermediate representation uh, uh, on the next slide. But basically, this means it's uh, taking the assembly and uh, analyzing it and converting it to higher level operations. For example, in assembly, you don't have a function call, you have a branch link, which means uh, when there's a function call, you have to gather all the arguments uh, from different assembly instructions. And that's a bit harder to analyze. So uh, Ghidra can do a high level analysis of the assembly and convert it to its own language with uh, the operations that are called P code. And for example, a, a call is a specific instruction there with all the arguments already. So uh, this conversion to intermediate representation makes sure that our search logic remains the same between different different assemblies because different assemblies are converted into the same p code instructions uh, and also makes the our logic easier because we don't have to go over assembly we can go over high level instructions this is further diluted like by our system uh, and the system actually uh, manages to detect in this p code uh, where there are uh, for example loops or uh, to detect buffer rights and uh, detect buffers that are tainted by the same source, which I'll go over later, which is needed for the final step. Uh, but before I get to that, just in parallel, what the system also does, the system maps which functions in the binary are uh, library functions, which is hard, of course, if you don't have symbols. If you have symbols, it's just a matter of uh, matching the name to uh, the known prototype. But if you don't have symbols, you actually need to figure out if, for example, function f here is strcpy or something like that. 
we need that because we rely on these functions uh, both for taint analysis and both for uh, sinks. Uh, if you recall, for example, strcpy is a sink function or a dangerous function, but we need to know beforehand this is this function is strcpy. The way we do that is pretty cool. Uh, it uses uh, emulation, and we'll get to that later. But uh, for now, let's say that we can map which functions are uh, library functions and which functions are just uh, vendor code, which uh, is not part of uh, glibc or any known library. So we use uh, all of these steps together. And in the end, we have a full knowledge of the information flow. Uh, and basically, to summarize that up, it means, for example, we are able to determine if an argument of system uh, in function f is calculated from the output of receive in function uh, g. Uh, and in this case, uh, like I said before, there's a data flow between re receive and system, which is considered a command injection. There are some cases where it's not a command injection if it's uh, filtered properly, but we'll also show how we can determine that. But this is the high level operation of the uh, data flow analysis engine. Okay, so, so let's uh, talk about Ghidra P code for a second. So Ghidra's decompiler uh, is able to lift uh, assembly instructions from a lot of languages, <laughs> uh, basically every language that Ghidra supports to high level intermediate representations. It's not on the level of a source code, uh, it's an intermediate representation. Uh, there's also the Ghidra decompiler, which lifts it even further in the UI if you use Ghidra, uh, and, and does convert it to uh, C, for example. But in our case, we work with the P code. It's uh, just easier for automated analysis purposes. So let's look at an example of a source, source code, how it's converted to ARM assembly, or thumb in this case, and how, how we see the decompilation eventually. So here in the source code, we just have a, a memset operation with some constants. It's a mem0 and with the 14 hex bytes of size. Uh, then we have two memory write operations. You can see we're writing a null to two pointers. And uh, we have another function call with uh, referencing one of uh, the variables here. So if we look at uh, the assembly, uh, ARM assembly, it's kind of all over the place. <laughs> if, you, if you look at the function calls, then, and this is even with symbols, of course. Uh, if you look at the function calls, you need to figure out what are the arguments you need to know about the ABI or how the functions are called in which registers, etc. And it's uh, pretty long also. It's uh, from four source code lines. Uh, it became uh, more than 10 uh, assembly lines. And uh, basically, it's a hassle to analyze. But once we run uh, Ghidra's uh, lifter or decompiler on it, we get a much uh, nicer output. So. The way that Ghidra shows it, basically there's the P code operation, which is similar to opcode, but a bit higher level. And uh, each P code operation has a variable amount of uh, inputs. Like for each P code operation, there's a specific amount of inputs. But uh, for example, a copy has uh, one input, but a call has an arbitrary amount of inputs and PTR sub has two inputs, for example. So each P code has a, a, some amount of inputs and also uh, an output, which can also be null in some cases, for example, a call. So we can see uh, in this case, uh, it converted the code to uh, two call operations. So we can see call, it's calling the address of uh, memset. And what it's giving as parameters is, first of all, some address here. But if we look one P code up, we can see it's a dereference of the RAM address of uh, RSCVDQ, so uh, this this is in line, you know, with with this first line here, and, and the other two uh, input arguments are constants. So this makes it much easier to understand, you know, just look at the call instruction and immediately understand what are the arguments. If it's constant, then it's literally immediate. If it's a dereference, you can follow up the stack and see what exactly the dereference is. The memory copy operations are signified by a copy. Uh, P code, you can see it's to a RAM address, so you know it's a memory write, and you can see exactly the constant. Unlike in assembly, where it might be like two opcodes, like writing to a register and then writing uh, to a dereference register. Uh, and also, pretty much the same with the last call here. 
So this is much, just much easier to analyze. Uh, and we use that level of abstraction uh, in order to have the same logic for any assembly language also. So the second part that we talked about, which is actually quite difficult, is understanding where external input is coming into the system or into the binary. So this is mapping these sources or uh, external input is harder than mapping uh, things usually. So let's see what we can do here. This is obviously a subset of everything <laughs> that we can do. So first of all, we have what we call high accuracy sources. So once we see these sources, it's pretty, we're pretty sure that uh, these are actually coming from user input. So for example, uh, mapping, uh, looking at syscalls, so or if we see the receive uh, syscall, we can say, okay, this is a source and it's a network source. It's basically bytes that come from the network and we consider it as, as network input. Of course, there might be firewalls on the way and things like that, but that's uh, out of scope uh, for, for this specific operation. Other things are local sources uh, might be F3 or getenv. So getenv is taking a value from the environment, which can be unsafe. F3 is taking reading from a file, which can also be unsafe. Um, so these are the, like some of the syscalls that we can look at. Also, if we're going down a bit uh, low level, uh, let's say it's a bare metal, it's a bare metal device or a real-time operating system, but we know uh, what uh, SOC it's running on. Uh, then actually, there's a very nice Ghidra project called SVD Loader, and uh, what it does, you input uh, basically the the name of the SOC or the name of the board that you're working on, and it maps peripherals to memory addresses. So, for example, it knows that the UART peripheral, which gets serial input, is mapped to address 10,000, then every time that you read from address 10,000, it will tell you, okay, this is UART. And then for example, UART or Bluetooth low energy is also things that we consider as uh, high accuracy sources. Uh, you just need that mapping from memory address to the type of peripheral. So other than high accuracy sources, we also have score-based sources, which are more of a heuristic, uh, but they're very helpful. And you can always build a score uh, of a you know, specific finding and say how high of a confidence you have in that finding. So for example, something that we saw a lot and we'll even see in this example, when N2HS or N2HL are used, so network to host short, or network to host long, basically flipping the bits of a big endian uh, integer. Uh, this is used when converting uh, network integers. So for example, you're reading an integer from network input and you need to use it in your program. Uh, you have to use one of these functions for conversion. So basically what we saw is this is a very strong indicator of a uh, network input, even if you don't go all the way back and see the receive, because the receive might be in a different binary, in a different part of the firmware, on a different peripheral but the code uh, that converts the integer, it's usually quite near the interesting uh, uh, parsing. For example, let's say it's a size, but the size is you know, coming from user input is, is unchecked and it's used for a buffer copy operation, then boom, you have a buffer overflow. So we can detect uh, these even without symbols and even when it's inlined uh, just by the git P code. And, and then we say, okay, the return value of these are user input for, from our uh, perspective with uh, lower confidence. Also, something else that we'll see here, if there are functions that reference protocol strings. So actually, let, let's uh, jump to an example, uh, some examples from <laughs> the relevant uh, firmware. It, it uses both, like I said, it has an HTTP server, an FTP server. And if you look at the functions that, for example, um, implement the HTTP receive or the FTP command loop, you can see a lot of familiar strings uh, like FTP command or HTTP headers. And then uh, if there's uh, enough of them, if it passes a certain threshold, you can say, okay, this is an interesting function. And what that means is you can assume, for example, that all the output arguments of that function and the return value is also user, user sources. Of course, again, this is a heuristic. It, might not be correct 100% of the time, but it was correct, for example, in this firm or in many others. And uh, we use it as a, a score-based mechanism to understand, you know, 
how likely this this output variable or return value is from user input. So after the return value comes from this function, for example, we track the data flow and we see if it goes to an interesting sync. Okay, so, so we talked about how to map the, the input sources or uh, user input as, as we call them. Mapping syncs is a bit easier, actually, uh, not in all cases, but in most cases. So uh, there's what we call basic syncs, which is basically function calls. Um, so certain function calls uh, will lead to certain CWEs or certain vulnerabilities. So for example, again, unfiltered input to system or popen means command injection. Unfiltered input, for example, when the user controls both the source and the, the size of the copy, and it goes out to a fixed size destination uh, of mem copy and STR CPY, it's a buffer overflow. And like I said, in the mem CPY case, you have to check both the source and the length are user controlled. Of course, it's not enough to check uh, one of them. So basically, uh, these are pretty easy to find. If you have symbols, it's immediate. You just see the function name and you say, okay, this is a sync. Uh, if you don't have symbols, you need to do uh, libc function mapping, which I'll talk about uh, in the next slide. And there are also the advanced syncs uh, because as you know, for example, memcpy and strcpy, uh, they can be inlined by the compiler uh, for optimization purposes. Or for example, there's a memcpy operation, but a bit change with specific conditions. So for example, here we can see a, we can see a copy loop, which is uh, pretty much strcpy, but uh, also it uh, looks, if uh, it reads uh, an at character, then it just stops. So it's uh, strcpy, but uh, with an additional uh, condition. But this is also a great sync. Like if we can provide, this is basically strcpy, we just need to not provide uh, an add character. So uh, we can also detect these kind of syncs by looking at specific P code uh, sequences and saying, ah, okay, this is like a pointer increment plus memory write without too much things in between. So this is memcpy or strcpy. So in the real world, you have to take care of such cases. Otherwise, you'll just get uh, false negatives. So um, I talked before about how a lot of uh, the functionality of the scanners rely on knowing uh, the library functions, both for data flow analysis purposes and for mapping out the sinks. So uh, there are a couple of cases. So you need to detect libc functions and library functions, basically. So let's start with an easy case. Let's say that uh, libc is uh, dynamically linked. In this case, no problem. You have function symbols, you're done. But let's say it's not dynamically linked. Let's say it's statically linked. And also the binary is stripped, uh, which is a very common case actually in uh, real-time operating system binary blobs. So this means you don't have function symbols and you have to figure out all the functions for yourself, I'm sure as uh, researchers and reverse engineers, uh, you had to do that yourself uh, a couple of times. So what we do is uh, we basically take each function that has a, that matches in terms of, uh, of prototype. And then um, we write test cases to understand how, the, how, if it's strcpy, for example, how it would behave. So you have inputs to the function, uh, in this case, we. Uh, in this case of the code, we test if it's str cat, for example. So you have inputs to the function. So for example, argument one is uh, <laughs> hello and argument two is a uh, world. Uh, and then you set up uh, the emulation for the function, for example, memory allocation, if you need writing out the, uh, the arguments, and then you call the function. So you call it via emulation. We use the unicorn engine, uh, as you can see here. We call the function and, and then we check if uh, the output of the function matches our test case, our expected test case, test case. In this uh, specific uh, case, uh, we check that the the return value is uh, is the same as the first argument, which is the output argument, and we check that the string was concatenated basically in the output. Of course, you you want to run as much test cases. This is just one test case for, for one function but you want to run multiple test cases uh, in order to make sure you're not 
confusing. For example, you may confuse strcpy with memcpy if your test cases aren't unique enough. But basically, this is a really great way of uh, identifying uh, the library functions. We opted to do this instead of uh, static analysis because static analysis uh, it just it, it can uh, meander too much. There's too many cases. There's too many compilers. So basically, we saw that running the code is the best way. Of course, these library uh, these library functions shouldn't have any syscalls or things that are hard to emulate. So if you hit a syscall or something like that, you know, okay, it's probably not a library function. Uh, so that's also how you avoid some of the candidates. So that was it for, for the libc analysis. Uh, so the next part is uh, probably <laughs> one of the hardest parts, but how to do data flow analysis. So that means I have, uh, you know, I know what my source is, I know what my sink is, but now I actually have to see that the source reaches the sink and even a further step is understanding that the, the source or user input reaches the sink without being filtered. So, so let's talk about uh, both of these things. So first of all, um, Ghidra itself provides a basic intra-function data flow analysis API. Intra-function meaning it can uh, determine uh, the flow of the variable but only inside a specific function. Once the variable is sent to a different function call, either by you know, calling a, a function of calling a child function or from returning this variable as a return value, it will not go over the, the variable. It, 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 it will keep track, it won't keep tracking the variable. So uh, basically Ghidra can do this for intra function. The API from the Java side is called get forward slice or get forward slice to pcode ops. Uh, Depends if you want the, the variable or, or, or the P code. And you can actually see it in the UI if you right click on a variable and choose a get forward slice. So for example, uh, this is what it will show you. It will highlight all of the usages of the variable. And, and this is not like a simple text research, text search because you can see, for example, here, uh, there's an assignment from phvar2, which is what we tracked into n. And now it knows that n is also tainted by phvar2. So if the attacker controls phvar2 uh, completely, then it also the attacker also controls n because n is assigned from a part of phvar2. And of course, this is recursive and goes on and on. And n can now be you know an output argument of some function, and then it will keep tracking it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But Ghidra, again, also does it for inside the function. It doesn't handle stack variables. It doesn't handle them well, at least. And uh, like I said, of course, doesn't propagate outside of the function or into child functions. So what we did is we took this intra-function data flow analysis and we expanded it to be inter-function. So um, if we look at an example here, and again, this, uh, this actually means taking care of a lot of uh, edge cases and a, a lot of different types of uh, assignments and function calls, etc. But basically, let, let's look at an example. We want to understand uh, in this code, for example, in these two defined functions, uh, whether any of the source variables reach a sync function. So let's say that uh, source is a function that defines a source <laughs> as part of an output argument. In, the, in a real world case, this could be uh, get env or receive with d being the buffer uh, or something similar. So uh, first the system will, will start at source. It will see that uh, source uh, is calling a uh, function f2 and it's passing the tainted variable. So it will follow <laughs> the, the function f2. Then, for example, using Ghidra's uh, analysis, it will see that function f2 writes the tainted variable to an output variable. This could also be a return argument, for example. Uh, but it, it knows now that it writes uh, the tainted variable to uh, B. And then it will pop back up the stack, see that B is actually A here. And A is an output variable of CS1. So basically what it deduced is that the source is coming out of this uh, function CS1 as an output argument of the, fir the first output argument uh, uh, with the name A. And then it will keep on doing this uh, analysis recursively uh, 
if A eventually gets to some sync function. So you have to go down functions, go down to child functions. You have to pop up functions because uh, either because the tainted variable is a return value or an output argument. And uh, basically, this is the engine uh, that we're running that expanded on Ghidra's basic analysis. So that's the data flow analysis part. But uh, other than the data flow analysis, of course, there might be other mitigating factors which actually prevent a real vulnerability. So even if there's full data flow uh, between user input and uh, the sync. So let's look at some uh, classic examples. So for example, for buffer overflow, there might be size checks. So if we look at this code example, um, here there's a buffer uh, with uh, 50 bytes allocated, but uh, if this uh, if condition won't be here, only the strcpy, then it's a buffer overflow. Uh, pretty simple, uh, but because of this if condition, the code checks whether uh, the length of uh, the user input is bigger than actually the size of the buffer. Uh, this could be either just a literal value or size of buff, and, which will also be a literal value in the binary. If this branch uh, actually happens, then uh, we return error. Um, so this is a classic uh, old school uh, buffer overflow check. Uh, you can still see this in embedded uh, firmware. But even though there's full data flow between the user input and uh, the buffer, because of this case, uh, there's no vulnerability. So you have to check for these filtering. Uh, let's see uh, an example with uh, command injection. So here we check using strpbrk uh, if the user input contains any shell meta character. So, uh, for example, uh, semicolon, backtick, ampersand, uh, output, pipe, etc. And if any of these uh, characters exist, then um, we return error because it's a malicious input. So, of course, um, there might be more characters just to make a point here. But again, this is filtering against command rejection, for example. So if there's this filtering and it's done well, then there won't be a command rejection vulnerability. Uh, there's also filterings that we define that are common and not related to a specific sync. For example, here, if uh, the user input isn't specifically fixed input, like contains the string fixed input, then we return an error. So even though this input is like, let's say read from the network after this condition, the input is not actually user input <laughs> because we have to know at this point, it's just a fixed string. So we cannot regard it as user input anymore. So this is also something to take into consideration. So all of these things can be uh, detected statically. Obviously, you have to take care of many, many cases. Uh, well, not, not a ton of cases, but you have to take care of uh, quite a number of cases. But it is quite possible to detect this statically and to reach critical mass where you know, you're handling all the common cases. So this is for basic filtering, but what about advanced filtering um, and what about advanced conditions? So for, for this, uh, what can be done is to employ a technique called symbolic execution. So uh, I'm not going to go deeply into symbolic execution because actually it's way out of scope <laughs> for this uh, presentation. I'm, I'm just going to mention uh, the high level methodology of using it. So let's say we have a very exotic filter, like we have a recursive function call with a very specific condition and you won't catch it with static, you know, with, with static, with a static analyzer, you won't catch like the branch. But uh, what you can do is uh, use symbolic execution and uh, symbolic execution engine. And uh, we highly recommend the anger open source uh, framework. Uh, it's relatively user friendly and uh, free. So what a symbolic execution engine does is for each, uh, line of, uh, of the source code, it emulates, sorry, for, for each line of the binary, uh, it, emula it, it emulates uh, the binary. And for each address in the code or for each basic block in the code, it uh, gathers a list of conditions on every data variable available in the program. Usually you constrain it to one variable you care about, but it, it gathers a list of uh, constraints or conditions that uh, will allow the execution to reach this point. 
So for example, uh, if we look at this code here, it has a bunch of uh, branches. Uh, so if A is bigger than one and B is uh, uh, smaller than 20. So we know that if we reach this part of the code, we only reach it if the, if again, the variable A is bigger than one and B is smaller than 20. We represent it by symbolic variables, in this case, X and Y. And then we can gather these conditions on each part of the program. And uh, so the interesting thing about the symbolic institution engine, the way we can use it is uh, once, let's say we saw statically uh, a, a source, so get env in this case, uh, and the sync uh, system. So, and even, you know, that statically we did data flow analysis and everything's all right. We just, we just want to use this te technique to understand if the source is being filtered in any way. So we will run the symbolic execution engine on this data path that we already found statically. And then we can understand if the variable user input, what kind of condition it has to fulfill in order to reach this point in the execution, the, the system call. So for example, if there isn't any instruction here, then user input is free of any conditions. And then uh, we know for sure uh, we can put whatever we want in it. Actually, the way um, you would uh, input it to the symbolic execution engine, you would add an additional constraint yourself. You would say, okay, now I'm requiring on the line, uh, uh, on the address where system is called, I'm also requiring an additional constraint of my own that, for example, one of the characters in this user input buffer uh, is a backtick. So why do we want to require this? Because if this condition or constraint is fulfilled, then we know, okay, actually we can put a backtick in one of the characters and this causes command injection. Uh, but this is just one of the examples. So if, uh, if this constraint is fulfilled and all of, these, uh, all of the other constraints are fulfilled uh, for this uh, address, then we actually know, okay, there's no, uh, the filtering, there's no filtering going on or the filtering is not enough to prevent us from executing code. So just for example, the, the last line uh, here, when, when the symbolic execution engine reaches this address, it might gather conditions such as, ah, the STR len of user input must equal three and the, the, the first byte of uh, the user input must equal A, uh, et cetera. And it gathers these constraints by emulating the code and analyzing memory writes, memory reads, uh, et cetera. So it's a very, very sophisticated engine. It's very compute intensive. That's why uh, you should only run it on basically uh, execution paths that you, uh, you pre-filtered and you understood, okay, this is the execution path that I'm interested in. If you'll just let it run and take any branch possible and define many symbolic variables, it will blow up. <laughs> basically uh, what they call branch explosion, it will just never finish running. So it can't just, it's not a magic bullet. You can't just run it <laughs> without any configuration and say, yeah, find the vulnerability for me. It's only for specific conditions. Uh, and in this case, we use it for filtering detection. So it's, it's, uh, it's not a magic bullet. You really need to understand how to use it. But uh, it's just a very interesting technique that is not a static technique. So uh, that's why it, it can find even very, um, very complex filtering mechanisms. All right, so now let's put everything together and see how we detect one of the infra halt uh, denial of service CVEs with all the with with all the techniques that we showed before with the automated techniques. Okay, so just to start, some details uh, about this CVE. It's an HTTP server denial of service, and uh, the problem here that there's a signed comparison that leads to a very big overflow. So if we look at the code, this there's this length argument which let's assume uh, right now it's coming from user input. And you can notice that uh, len is an integer. Then this integer is being compared against the signed value, which this is a problem because if one of them is uh, negative, it would, will not uh, get the output result that you want. And then uh, memcpy is called again with this length that is user controlled. And of course, it's, if, if it's a negative value here, it will be considered as an unsigned value, which is just a huge value and will cause an overflow. So let's see how, uh, let's see the steps of finding these automatically. 
So first of all, source detection. So the source in this case is uh, A2L, and actually it was detected using the dynamic uh, STD layer mapping that I talked about, the emulation. So basically here we had an unknown function, but actually it's A2L, uh, the emulation engine ran on it, so that it's uh, A2L. And what it does uh, in context of the code is parse content length. So uh, you give it the, the, the buffer uh, uh, right after content length, it parses it, and then you get the content length in LVAR7, uh, and then LVAR7 is written to this uh, struct. So basically now with the data flow analysis engine, we know that HP or source field is, uh, is a tainted uh, value that comes from user input. So, we, so the system marks the field as having user input. So the, the next step after that is, of course, using the data flow analysis engine. So in this case, the data flow analysis engine tracked the HP struct through uh, various functions. You can see that even the first call is a data reference. If there's a data reference, we consider it the same as a code flow because we do want to find more cases. It might lower the confidence of the finding, but we still want to see that finding. So in this case, uh, the, the, the struct was uh, was tracked between uh, five different functions, uh, read message, WPS loop, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So eventually after all this data flow analysis, we get to the sync. Uh, in this case, like we saw before, the sync is a MemCPY operation. So this is what causes the heap overflow eventually. Um, the tracked variable uh, is the len variable, which is the second variable, uh, second argument to this function. Uh, you can see it reaches uh, both the if condition and the memcpy operation. So this was the variable that was tracked uh, through the data flow analysis. Uh, an interesting caveat here is that because there's the if check uh, before the memcpy, uh, this is, and it's a signed if check, uh, this is considered a signed comparison type of bug. Uh, if there wouldn't be any if check, it would just be classified as a heap overflow. Uh, and if the if check would be unsigned, then actually it would be classified as a non-vulnerability because that's a proper check and you can't usually get around that. Um, and that's it. After we saw the sync, uh, the source, the data flow analysis and the sync, uh, I hope you got a better understanding of how this automated vulnerability detection might work and how it can find bugs uh, in real world programs. Uh, and I hope it was entertaining and you learned a bit more about uh, automated vulnerability detection. Thank you.